When looking ahead to Survivor Series 2017, I still stand by my thoughts initially that this feels like a bastardized version of the old bragging rights pay-per-view concept where it's pretty much Raw versus SmackDown. And in and of itself, the premise of doing Raw versus SmackDown at Survivor Series isn't, I suppose, that terrible. But it does feel like the WWE really didn't know what the hell to do with this show. And doing this Raw versus SmackDown stuff to me was almost a way for the WWE to kind of get off the hook from really having to write much of anything at all. They could just plaster together matches. It's like the ideal situation for the company. They could put together some matchups and they don't really have to work very hard in order to get there, which is pretty much their uh, basic creative model right now. But looking at this show, one question I do have is, why in the hell is this damn show four hours? I understand you want to distinguish between the big four and the lesser pay-per-views, and I'm fundamentally fine with that. But just because a show can go four hours does not mean that this show needs to go four hours. Now, surely the in-ring nerds are going to talk about how both of the five-on-five -five tag matches will probably get some time, Shield versus New Day will get time, and Brock Lesnar versus AJ Styles will get time. And you were probably absolutely correct on every one of those. However, again, just because they can get a bunch of time and will get a bunch of time does not deal with the fundamental question of whether or not they should get a bunch of time. Because when you get to a point where you only have seven matches on the main card and you're trying to stretch over four hours, that leads to either matches that are too long, that go outside of the concept of what they need to be, or you're trying to kill time and fill time, and that usually doesn't lead to the best quality of show. I also find it interesting that people that you've dedicated quite a bit of television time to in recent months and uh, differing importance level of stories, like Jason Jordan, Jinder Mahal, Kevin Owens, Sami Zayn, that none of these guys are actually booked on the Survivor Series show as it's presented right now. Now, granted, you would expect Jinder is probably going to get involved. Owens and Sami Zayn may very well get involved. It's just really strange that you would have these guys that you've devoted television time to that you're just not booking ahead of time. Like I said, I do anticipate several of these guys, if not most, if not all of them, to get involved in some way. It's also kind of strange how um, the company just kind of threw caution to the wind and they went into corrective mode late. And I will say this, even though they made some changes at the last minute, it probably helped the show. Charlotte winning the SmackDown Women's Championship now puts her against Alexa is probably more interesting than Alexa versus Natalia. And at least that way, in theory, you have a babyface versus heel component, which is largely lacking on this card. You had the Bar win the Tag Team Championships, uh, the Bar versus the Usos. I probably look forward to that match more than I would Rollins and Ambrose, and especially because it allowed Rollins and Ambrose and Roman uh, to form up as the Shield and face the New Day. That was, again, probably a good decision for this particular show to make that tag title switch. You've added Cena and Triple H to the five-on-five uh, men's traditional tag match. You had AJ Styles go over Jinder Mahal. So now instead of bitching about Jinder versus Brock, uh, champion versus champion to Survivor Series, now it's AJ Styles versus Brock Lesnar, which feels a little bit more worthy of a big four pay-per-view main event. Let's let's be real. It's just it's kind of weird that somebody like Jason Jordan, who you have invested television time in, you just completely dismissed and cast aside. And when you look at like the five on five tag matches, all these guys are older. Like I think I think the youngest guy on the SmackDown team is either Shinsuke or it's Randy. I can't remember which one is technically younger. But these are guys again in their mid to late thirties. It's just indicative of how right now the WWE doesn't seem to be all that concerned about the future because they are in survival uh, win now type of mode because they feel like they need to be and that's probably not all that off base they probably do need to be because yes it's great to think about the future and focus on the future and I wish this company would more 
But the fact is the present isn't very good, and you need to get the present better to get some numbers up, to get some numbers better for the future to even matter. Um, so when you look at some of the changes that were made, they were probably changes that were made for the better, for the betterment of the show. That is true. But I still fundamentally look at the whole premise of this pay-per-view, like I said again, being a bastardized version of bragging rights, and I wonder why would anybody on Raw or SmackDown care about this other than for bragging rights? There's literally nothing else at stake. Nothing else matters. Like, why would Stephanie McMahon give a crap about this match? Like, everything's riding on it because there's no control riding on it. There's no anything riding on anything. There isn't. Why would Shane McMahon and his SmackDown crew have felt the need to invade Raw to begin with? And then why would Raw have taken like a month, I believe, to really come back and try and get at SmackDown? It's just... The whole premise of it is just kind of dumb. I am glad the show is in Houston. It's, uh, it's an event that will help that city economically, and Lord knows they most certainly could use it. When looking at this show, though, what it really honestly is, is the epitome, the personification of what we would call with the WWE now, just a shut-up-and-watch show. And to me, when you think about well, you don't want just to shut up and watch, though, because you should be developing characters, you should be advancing stories along, you should be creating new stories. So this would typically be the type of show that would aggravate me a tremendous deal. That said, in this particular case, at this time, knowing some of maybe what the company is trying to do, and you could start some of that here at Survivor Series, but other things you're trying to stall, like Roman and Brock, you're trying to stall for later on down the road, I'm okay with this kind of being a, just a shut up and watch show. I really am. And it doesn't mean that it's automatically going to be good. I understand for those that just get off on the, the action, the flips, the kicks, the high spots, the bumps and all of that, they'll probably love this stuff. But it doesn't necessarily mean that just because you don't have to think a lot during this show that it's automatically going to be a good show. The matches themselves, some of them could be crappy. The wrong people could go over. The finishes could be off, could be crap. And so, so there's still a lot of ways for WWE to screw this up. That said, I expect when we come back from this after Sunday night, we're probably going to say it was a decent show, couple of good matches, maybe there's one or two surprising things that happened, but what does it really mean and what's next? Um, let's talk about the match card and give some predictions. The kickoff show, I'd fully expect Enzo to retain the Cruiserweight title over Kalisto. Um, I guess. Who the fuck knows? They had Kalisto win that Cruiserweight title just because it was Eddie Guerrero's birthday. Just to drop it right back to Enzo. The way this company hot potatoes the titles, who the hell knows? Um, and really in the grand scheme of things, that match at this particular time means about two bags of dicks. That's about it. Uh, looking at the main card. Women's champion versus women's champion. Alexa Bliss versus Charlotte. I would assume... With some of the sentimentality about Ric Flair and maybe thinking about having him there in Houston, I would expect Charlotte to win here. That's probably the right decision because Alexa as a heel can more easily survive a loss than Charlotte as a recently crowned women's champion. It was just kind of weird that Charlotte won this belt right before the pay-per-view. Like, it wasn't the WWE planning this out. It was just the WWE making a knee-jerk, reflex, reactionary move. That said, I think... The fundamentals of Alexa and Charlotte are better than Alexa versus Natalia. So I'm okay with this. Like I said, I would expect Charlotte to win. The five-on-five -five women's tag match. In an ideal world, you would have Asuka and Nia Jax completely obliterate and destroy the SmackDown side. That's what you would have happen. I have to be careful because you don't want to make the SmackDown women look stupid. You don't probably what's more likely to happen, or I should say is just as equally likely to happen, is this stupid damn company would have everybody on the Raw team survive except Alicia Fox. It's kind of strange that she was the team captain, but hey, maybe it's one of those respect things of, hell, you're still here after all these years. Uh, but this company is just as likely to have Sasha and Bailey be the two survivors and eliminate Nia and Asuka. Um, this is where you get kind of into the trouble of this type of show because... If you have like Asuka and Nia, let's say, blow through everybody, which in theory fundamentally is what this should be, then you make Naomi look stupid 
former women's champion. Natalia looks stupid, former women's champion. Becky Lynch looks stupid, former women's champion. Carmella, former Money in the Bank uh, holder. Uh, not to mean it doesn't really matter. But in the grand scheme of things, you get what I'm saying. It, it needs to be Asuka and Nia Jax are the survivors, and we'll see what they do. They'd be just as likely to have four of the Raw women survive unless... This is where they finally did some shit between Sasha and Bayley. I don't really know. And I don't care. Uh, the Bar versus the Usos. Tag champs versus tag champs. Kind of strange again because it's kind of heel team versus heel team. My allegiance will probably go to the Usos in this one, if anybody. But should be a good, high-impact, physical type of tag match. I'd assume it gets a decent amount of time. Uh, the match that I have some morbid curiosity about is the Miz versus Baron Corbin, your two mid-card champions. Uh this is a big match for Baron Corbin. He's even a featured spot with a featured guy on a big four pay-per-view. The bottom line is, is Baron Corbin needs to step up and Baron Corbin needs to show that he can hang. Because otherwise what's going to happen, and it might still happen anyways, is The Miz is going to be the unanimous babyface in this match in a big, 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 big way. And that's probably what will happen. Now, you would assume with the Miz Taraj that the Miz would win, and frankly, the Miz should win, because the Miz matters, and Baron Corbin is bullcrap, period. Uh, the five-on-five -five men's Survivor Series traditional tag match. This is a match full of old men. I'm sorry, it's just the way it is. Bobby Roode, Randy Orton, Shane McMahon, Shinsuke Nakamura, John Cena versus Samoa Joe, Braun Strowman, Kurt Angle, Finn Balor, and Triple H. You could clearly see they were trying to load up this match. And it's interesting they would basically just totally piss off Jason Jordan to the side for the sake of God. But ultimately, we have gotten to that point in time of year where arguably the most important thing in WWE is what, ladies and gentlemen? It's God's Minion match Which means uh, now he's going to be on the show's more. And it is glorious on everything that is the Hunter, the Hearst, and the Helmsley. That's how it should be, Dad. That's how it should be. And you could really call this the Breakfast Club's last stand, even though it's never the last stand because it's the Breakfast Club. You've got Cena, Orton, Triple H, all these years later, they're still in a featured Survivor Series match. Ow, baby! Now, with that said, you, you, you wonder what we're setting up here for down the road. Are we setting up for Cena versus Joe? Are we setting up for Angle versus Shane? Or are we setting up for God versus Shane? It's interesting now that this is going to be the second straight pay-per-view that Kurt Angle's work. I wonder where they're going with this. In theory, the best booking decision would be that Braun Strowman would dominate and he would be your sole survivor. Or you would have Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn interfere and cost Team SmackDown the match. To me, those are the two viable things you could do. I don't know what the hell is going to happen. But I can't wait to see. And my God, if Cena and Orton are the sole survivors for the SmackDown team, or God is the sole survivor for that freaking Raw team. Oh, baby! It's going to be Breakfast Club bitches left, right, center, straight up your ass! It'd be magnificent. What else we got? The Shield versus the New Day. Sure. Why not? This is just literally nothing more than a time killer for the New Day until you have them win the tag belts again and until you get to Roman versus Brock at WrestleMania. That's all this is. I'd expect the Shield to win, you would think, since Roman wasn't there at TLC and the Shield won there in a three-on-five handicap match that they would win here in a straight-up three-on-three match, and that's exactly how this should all play out. Because in the grand scheme of things, ultimately, SmackDown was the heel, because they're the ones that invaded to begin with, so it would make sense for the Raw guys to go over. It would. And then we get to the main event, which is Brock Lesnar versus AJ Styles, Universal Champion versus WWE Champion. In the match at this point in time, we would assume would be the main event. Although, if they do something screwy, like having Jinder Mahal interfere and cost AJ Styles the match, it may not main event. But maybe it will. And it's just, it's really interesting to me if they do have somebody, let's say, like Jinder Mahal interfere in this match. Because 
you didn't think Jinder Mahal was important enough to have him carry the strap that he had carried for a while into Survivor Series and face somebody like Brock, but it would potentially be okay for him to interfere and cost AJ Styles the match to where he would get his rematch and then potentially recapture the belt back. It's just really, really strange and really odd. Now again, that said, I would have crapped all over Jinder versus Brock more likely than not, and a lot of other people would too. AJ Styles versus Brock Lesnar feels like a more appropriate Big Four pay-per-view main event. This should be, in theory, if Brock is willing to work with AJ, because again, AJ can make a lot of people look good, and he could make Brock look outstanding, because AJ Styles is the phenomenal one for a reason. Then this match should be a lot of fun, and it should be an exciting main event, even if we get that ultimate dud of a crap uh, finish of Jinder Mahal interfering. But then you get, again, into kind of the space of you've got your two world champions. How can you really have either one of them go over clean? Because you automatically, you automatically make the other champion look not as strong. And you just, that's what's weird about this show for the WWE in so many ways. And this is the biggest thing that I knock about this concept. In and of itself, the show could potentially be a lot of fun. In and of itself, you've got some interesting matchups. But ultimately, you've got several champion versus champion matches where if you're not careful, you make one of them maybe look better, but not necessarily while you make the other one look weak or look stupid because one of the champions has to win and one of the champions has to lose. And why would you do that to your champions? To me, you want to make your champions look as good as possible, as strong as possible. And they didn't do that here. It was just really, really weird, the thought process behind all of this. But we'll find out come Sunday when we watch four hours of this crap. Four hours! Oh, If you drink, you smoke, maybe you'll need it, maybe you won't. I know I'm going to need something to help keep me up through four hours of this, that's for sure.